Can you guys hear me? Yes. All right, great. So I'm going to indulge in some rabble rousing, which is, uh, uh, I just want to say, you know, I kind of was here at the beginning of this effort to increase the block size, and our first Satoshi's Vision conference was like, it was literally a conference room about twice the size of this stage, right? <laughs> yeah. No, this is the second. Um, and when I look out and see, you know, everyone here, it's just awesome. And development is actually, you know, now a small part of this movement, whereas before everything was about the development. So now, you know, uh, in the first conference I talked like, I don't know, four times. In this one, it's like, well, maybe we can stick you in, in the middle of, right, all these other talks about awesome stuff. So uh, I just want to thank everyone for, you know, being a part of this movement and thinking differently. Um, so today, um, I want to talk about um, um, basically adoption. Everyone seems to feel like that's important. Uh, so do I. Um, so in, on August 1st, some people might think that was like victory when we forked, and it was something to celebrate. But I feel like leading up to that, it was all negotiation. And when we forked, now, you know, it's war, right? Um, and we gave up uh, a really valuable um, tool, which was, um, you know, the um, network effect and being all over CNBC and all this stuff. But um, we gained a really good tool as well, and that, of course, is the hard fork in our, you know, willingness to uh, deploy awesome features to make Bitcoin Cash awesome. So. Um, um, I think we need to uh, essentially deploy that feature, and we are planning to, to uh, you know, increase adoption. Um, we have the capacity to um, maintain uh, a network effect, um, and uh, now is the time to do it. Why I think now is the time um, we, that we don't have time, it may be simply because uh, you know, my professional history was working in startups, and so in a like, startup, in, you know, yesterday is the time, right? Everything has to be done uh, three weeks ago. But um, also, um, you know, we might be entering into a bit of a bear market in cryptos in general, right? And um, it's much easier uh, at the bottom to make that change and, you know, create a, a bit of a, a higher um, uh, sort of adoption increase for, for your coin and leave everyone else's in the dust than it is at the top when everyone's already talking about Bitcoin every single day, right? So um, if you imagine that the, the bear market will last, I don't know, maybe a year, right, or less, um, then uh, we need these technologies deployed now so that three to six months from now when people start uh, the, the general public starts getting excited about crypto again. We have this stuff ready in wallets in consensus. Um, and um, two things we can do is, uh, you know, to counter the, the propaganda type stuff is to do novel development efforts. Um, and of course, if we do development, it might, um, you know, drive SPV wallet installs with uh, these new features. Um, and finally, um, I want to introduce an idea that um, might be a little bit um, <laughs> controversial, and that is um, actually if, um, if we implement a feature and um, we do it in a slightly different way, right, if we're not just copying existing blockchains, um, then uh, that's actually better in many ways than uh, implementing the same feature. Uh, let's say you implement a feature and it's worse in seven metrics but better in three, right? You're going to create a niche for your, uh, um, for your product. And that's essentially exactly what happened with um, XThin and Compact Blocks. There's still um, a huge debate over which one's better. And the reality is that um, uh, XThin, just if you look at the aggregate bandwidth, I think it's slightly higher than Compact Blocks. However, some of that bandwidth is sent in the other direction. So in Compact Blocks, it has a higher download bandwidth than XThin, but what XThin does is it sends uh, some information in the reverse direction. So if you have, you know, so basically depending on um, 
the, the way your network works, one might actually be better than the other. So uh, do things differently so we create niches. Um, so from there, I want to talk about um, some of the things you know, that, uh, that I want to do um, to uh, drive adoption. So the first one is this. Uh, uh, so there's obviously op group, which was discussed a lot yesterday. So I changed this talk now to focus more on data sig verify. And then at the end, I'm just going to show a little bit of um, op group stuff. So op data sig verify, the basic idea is um, the blockchain uh, and scripting um, uh, is kind of useless if there isn't a lot of data, right? I think um, I haven't reviewed uh, Dr. Wright's paper, but he just released a paper, I think, showing that uh, the scripting language is um, Turing complete, right? But what's the use of a Turing complete program if you have no data to use it on, right? Um, so what Opdata Sig Verify does is it, uh, it allows you to import external data into the blockchain. Um, so it basically uses the idea of an oracle or a trusted data source. Um, we can't, like, every piece of data in the entire world can't be a consensus rule, right, that's verified by every node. So you just, you need the idea of an oracle. Um, and so actually, when you really think about it, um, the idea of oracle versus consensus uh, exists on a um, continuum. And I think these are, you can kind of prove that they're the only options. Um, so. Uh, you know, in the classic way you prove something is you, you propose the, um, the opposite. So propose there are, you know, unknown, untrusted nodes. So if, you know, one may lie, then another node may lie about that one lying. So therefore, all the nodes must validate and you get what we call a consensus rule, right? So as, as soon as you say that a node is not trusted, you're forced into consensus. Those are your two choices. But what's kind of interesting here is if you look on this continuum of trusted versus untrusted um, information. Um, over on the left side, we have oracles. And you could you know, um, use um, information from multiple sources to increase your untrusted level, right? Pull in um, stock information from two or three oracles instead of just one. Um, now, emergent consensus, I kind of put in the middle. It's kind of interesting because uh, it, um, it follows it kind of says, oh, you know, there's some weird stuff that I don't trust going on in the network, so I will trust the majority of miners, right? So that's why it's just a little bit to the right. Um, and then headers first mining is, you know, a technique where you very briefly trust um, a miner um, before you uh, receive all and validate the block, so that is much further. And then finally, untrusted in consensus. Okay. Um, How much time do I have? When is it? Do I? Is it, am I up to ten forty-five or? Oh, <laughs> well, great. We're ahead. Um, okay, so updated sig verify sounds like um, you know just some really abstract thing, and I don't think I've convinced you guys how it's going to help adoption, right? So I want to give you. I want to go straight to like the scenario I see. Um, first use case is peer-to-peer uh, -peer betting. So uh, what, I, um, what I envision is you're sitting in the bar with your friends and watching the game, right? And you want to make a bet. And of course, you know that if you lose, I mean, if you win, he's not going to pay, right? Because that's what always happens. OK, so what you do is you get him to install the Bitcoin Cash wallet. All right. And then um, you, know, you can just pop up your phone. You set up a bet, right? And then you tap phones, and um, and that bet will access you know data from the FIFA you know if you're watching uh, football as they call it around here. Um, then uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, um, then it will automatically access um, you know a relatively trusted data source compared to the level of your bet, right? Like I would envision that you know. Uh, FIFA, the NFL, all these people could just be producing um, signed data about their, their um, you know, what's happened. And what's really um, sort of awesome about separating these two things is that the person who's producing this data is not involved in your bet, 
right? Has no idea that it's happening. So this is probably, I'm not a lawyer, but I think this is very important from a legal perspective, right? And also he's not, uh, he doesn't have custodianship of your money, right? That's also very important. Um, yeah, um, so now if you move us, so like in the US, um, in most jurisdictions, so in the US, um, the ability to gamble is defined by the state. So it's, you know, a really confusing morass of craziness, right? But, um, um, but generally, uh, you know, person-to-person -person betting is, is legal, but um, what's not legal is like being a bookie or uh, doing pools, right? Um, so does anyone here, do people here know what like fantasy sports are? It's like a US phenomenon. Okay, so almost none of you know. Um, so I'm going to preface this by saying this crazy idea called fantasy sports is a seven billion dollar industry in the U.S. Okay, and this is the idea: is you can't you can't do pooled betting, you can't do bookies. So what you're going to do is you're going to convert sports betting into a game of skill. This is the trick. Okay, so what everyone does is is you get a group of people together and you basically pick your favorite. Um, you do like you know a draft pick. And so you create your own team with your own players. And then every week, uh, how your actual players perform in their games and you know, how many yards they pass. It's, football, of course, is what, uh, American football is what you know, is the most popular. Um, and, it, and it's very um, statistics based. So you can take all the statistics about how the players performed. And from that, you can actually kind of create a score of how your team would have performed, OK? And, um, and so uh, there is like, I think, 50 million people who, um, who do this in the US. And the entire reason why this, in, this game was created was because it's illegal to bet on sports in the US, right? So this is now not betting on sports because it's a game of skill because you're choosing your players, all right? Um, so, um, so let's say we, um, we use op data sig verify to, um, so first of all, um, you could use op data sig verify in like this fantasy sports to, um, you know, again, to kind of um, make side bets or remove the, um, remove the flow of money, uh, you know, into the fantasy sports site, right? You can do it sort of locally. Um, and another thing is you could create um, um, a, uh, you know, a Bitcoin contract uh, that uh, would basically be a pool, which would pay out to you know, multiple people depending on which sports team won. And that is actually an interesting concept because in that case, who is the bookie, right? Who is the pool? Uh, there's nobody, right? So I wonder if... Um, that actually may be legal in many jurisdictions. All right, um, so do people know what binary contracts are? Yeah, so binary contracts, uh, I only saw one or two nods. Those are like, if you're, if you're like in the bar, it's betting. If you have a suit on and you're on Wall Street, it's binary contracts, right? And those are legal in the US, but one of the big problems is that um, a lot of times, um, in several cases in history, um, at least in the US, um, the the uh, you know the company who underwrote the binary contract would uh, you know suddenly disappear one night and and you know a whole brouhaha would would ensue so um, because they would take the other side of the bet instead of finding you know matches so what's great about this again is it's a peer to peer binary contract there's no middlemen um, finally for um, data sig verify there's this weird idea of opcode emulation which I'll talk about later and then prediction markets um, which I'll talk about. So, um, so now this might be a little, so I'm gonna talk about how you actually might make these scripts using this op data sig verify. So this is gonna get a little technical. Um, this is, so let's imagine that the Oracle is producing a data format, which is, a, uh, I just did it for simplicity, eight byte timestamp, uh, which would be seconds since the epoch. That would be really dumb for an Oracle to actually use for a sports game, because who cares down to the second, but just you know, bear with me here. Um, and then the match would be five bytes and the winner is two. So here we have uh, yesterday, we had uh, Argentina versus Brazil. I don't actually know who won, so I just wrote down Brazil. Because um, that's who I want to win. Um, 
And uh, so this, now, this might be something that you've never seen before. Um, it's, like a, it's like a macro assembler for Bitcoin script. I call it bitch script. Uh, and I've been experimenting with it, yeah. So basically, um, I think it makes it a lot easier to understand what's going on. So um, you, uh, macro assembly is like, you know, me showing my age. Do, do you guys know what a macro assembler is? Okay, so almost nobody. So in, imagine this. Um, there are no function calls, because there are no function calls in, in you know, Bitcoin script, right? So every function that's defined just replaces the contents, just like a macro, of the function inside the call, okay? So um, here we're gonna uh, parse the data of the binary contract, um, and you know you have some input values, and then whenever I have the at sign data, uh, what I'm defining there is I'm saying, okay, this is actually a parameter that exists on the Bitcoin stack. Okay, so it, you wouldn't actually pass that parameter, but you're sort of implicitly passing it because you're gonna rely on it already being on the stack. So um, the very first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna split out the uh, timestamp. And so, by the way, this is, um, you know, the synergy of um, the new op codes that are being proposed with op data sig verify, right? So op split doesn't exist now, right? But um, uh, Mr. Steve Shatters is proposing that we add it. Um, so we're just gonna break that, uh, you know, the first item in the stack um, up uh, in, you know, by the first eight bytes and then the rest. Um, and then we're gonna verify that the first eight bytes equal the date of the match. And then, you know, we're gonna split the rest of it into five bytes and, you know, two bytes. And uh, that gets put on the stack. And so then we do equal verify that the, um, that the match is uh, you know Australia versus I mean uh, Argentina versus Brazil, and then you know we check that the winner matches the winner code, right? So this is um, a pretty easy way to um, to check that uh, you know to kind of basically parse out uh, this data, and now um, here would be the actual bet. So um, updated sig verify um, takes. Um, two items uh, on the stack, which, you know, uh, so the, um, the spender is providing these items, and that is the actual data um, and the signature. And then um, the vout offers the, or, you know, the oracle's address. And so now opt what opdata sig verify does is it validates that the signature uh, is valid across that data for the, you know, past address, and if so, um, it pops the uh, signature and the address off the stack, leaving the data, okay? Um, and so then, um, having verified uh, this Oracle data, we're then gonna um, run this decider function, and that happens to be this parse data one. Uh, so then we're left with who the winner is, you know, true or false if the winner, so then we just do op if, and uh, you know, if that's true, then we'll pay to public key hash of address one, Otherwise, we'll pay it at public key hash address two. Um, and so then finally, um, all that comes together into this make bet function. Um, so that, that would create a, um, a Bitcoin cash uh, bet. Now, as I was saying, obviously, you wouldn't type all this every time you want to make the bet. Some sort of you know, wallet code would uh, do this for you. Um, so here at the very bottom, I show, you know, an actual sort of uh, instantiation of this uh, code into a, you know, into a particular bet. All right. So, um, so I just want to. Um, so we, we're going from, you know, scripting with exactly two scripts, you know, that have ever been used, right? Um, pay to public key hash and multisig, and now we have all kinds of awesome scripts, so I just wanna talk about um, some of the stuff you could do. So there's one big problem with um, the previous um, uh, description of the bet contract, and that is like, uh, what if, um, up in this case, um, here where I'm verifying the Oracle's data, 
and I do op equal verify. So what if I screwed something up and I'm expecting the wrong data and the Oracle is never gonna, you know, I, I put in a match that doesn't even exist, right? So in that case, you would want some sort of escape clause that says, look, if uh, no winner is picked, let's just call the bet, you know, a bad bet and, and get the money back. Um, and so in the first, uh, you know, formulation, I didn't do that, um, but we can just kind of add on to that, which is um, here, here's a bet with an escape. So it has everything in the original bet, and then a Boolean that says, um, do I want to just abort the bet? And so if I want to abort the bet, then, you know, in order to uh, successfully spend that, you're going to do a multi-sig, um, uh, you know, um, V out with, um, you know, the two um, participants in the bet, right? Both have to agree that we're going to abort the bet. And otherwise, you just do the normal bet. Um, so to do betting pools, you would just have a big if statement that says um, up here, um, I have it all written out, but I decided it was too much uh, information to show on the screen. Um, but you know, you just want to have um, other. Um, instead of saying uh, just do I compare op equal to the winner, right? I want to say okay. If the winner of you know the entire World Cup is you know Brazil, then pay out to this address. Otherwise, to these other people. Okay. Um, so all this stuff is entirely implementable with uh, op data sig verify and the. Um, op codes that are proposed, um, you know, for uh, the, the May hard fork. Um, so here's an, uh, so I think, I hope I've convinced you that, you know, betting is totally awesome and it'll work. Um, so moving on to uh, this other idea called op code emulation. Um, so let's assume that you have this, um, this interesting function that you think, you know, really ought to be a new op code. But um, everyone else says, they're basically, you know, justify, prove to me that this opcode is going to be worthwhile, right? So what you could do is you could say, fine, um, what I'm going to do is create a little service, and you give it, you know, the opcode's parameters, and I will give it the output, and I'll sign it. And so, yes, to use, you know, for now, because the opcode is not added to Bitcoin scripting language, you have to trust this oracle to produce the right value, right? But, you know, given that you do trust that, you could basically emulate any, um, any you know, stateless opcode, right? Op, op chain height, give me the current height of the chain is not emulatable because that's data that changes every time, right? But, you know, what's the hash of a particular block, right? Um, so, for example, um, there's an interesting service, uh, Factum, which um, kind of creates a huge Merkle tree of, um, you know, it allows people to store information on the blockchain, right? So it creates a huge Merkle tree of all that information. Um, so to give an example of what you might think is, what if Factum now um, added a feedback loop and used updated SIG verify to allow anybody to validate uh, anybody to use any information in a script that has been stored into these factum um, Merkle trees, right? And so, and then if that became, so that would sort of also be an emulation of a new opcode, which would be, you know, op get factum data, right? Um, I'm not actually suggesting, it's a really long road to, to think about, um, you know, bringing all of that data into, um, uh, you know, into consensus, but at the same time, it's just fascinating to consider how um, op data sig verify can allow you to um, uh, to um, sort of encourage people to try and use new opcodes without having to create a whole new altcoin, right, to uh, make that happen. In um, a lot of like in my previous talk last year, um, I was also talking about how can we uh, ext you know, add new features to the blockchain without doing it on altcoins. And this is continuing with that idea, right? And that will ultimately uh, increase um, the adoption of Bitcoin Cash rather than creating competitors. All right, so um, 
you know, there's always some question about um, how complex is this? So um, I just, this is the entire implementation of updated SIG Verify. Um, so my goal was to basically have the maximum impact for the minimum amount of consensus effort, right? And the reason why this is so simple is because it's using um, the uh, ECDSA uh, you know, signature validation that has existed in Bitcoin forever, right? So, and so this code too, the, uh, the pubkey.recover compact, every time you do sign message or ver a verify message in this case, right, you're calling that function. So this is, you know, other than this little bit, the, the operation of this code is just extremely, um, it, uh, you know, um, it's not new, right? It's not novel, it's extremely stable. Um, so please don't say, it's too much. <laughs> All right, um, so let me move on to op group. Uh, we talked about that a lot yesterday, so I just want to do a quick summarize. Um, uh, so why do I think it'll be awesome on wallets? Uh, so it enables native tokens, um, uh, and this is important because Bitcoin Cash becomes the medium of exchange, right? Um, whenever you want to, if you have stock or something, whenever you want to make a trade, you need to use your Bitcoin Cash as the, the cash side of that, right? Um, it's the only solution that is SPV wallet compatible. I don't think people are going to be holding stocks on their phones, right? But I think they're going to be holding uh, coupons and tickets and um, all these other tokenization things. Uh, about three weeks ago, I went down to New York and they have this app that lets you pay for their subway. Um, and literally, like, um, you hold the app up to the guy, and you just, um, you, you kind of show him, you know, that you have the ticket on your phone, you know, and, you, and if you have multiple tickets, you kind of show him that there's three. I was like, that, you know, I could create a fake app in, like, a day, right, and then get free rides for the rest of my life. I mean, this is, you know, this is a huge use case. This has been solved in a lot of cities, so they have these unique services that change every day. Not in New York. <laughs> it, was, it was literally just this, you know, it was, anyway. Um, but I promise you I could figure out what the image was and then add it to my app, right? Just pull it, right? You need one person. Um, Yeah, so having a token on your phone, right? And then you basically, you know, Suica style, touch a, uh, an entry style and it just, it just does a, uh, you know, cryptographic challenge and signature, you're done, right? It'd be awesome. And I just want to mention the, the original form of op group um, had a, only allowed um, unlimited minting, but I added a limited feature and it pegged you know, one token to one Satoshi. I removed that peg, so I just wanted to call that out to try to correct the, the impression. Um, uh, yeah, so I think this is like the last slide. Um, so this is our scaling philosophy. It's better for full nodes uh, and mining nodes to be expensive, and people can use SPV wallets, right? And that is what op group allows you to do. So op group is aligned with our scaling philosophy, not unaligned. Um, oh, and um, just I just don't want you to really look at this closely, but last night, um, you know, people are asking, well, how well baked is op group? So I just ran through um, here uh, the, the CLI commands to create a new token. I got a few addresses. I sent. Uh, you know, Bitcoin Cash to the address, and then I minted at the very bottom. I minted a thousand tokens down there, and then um, this is the output of it. Um, so you, can, this is the actual. Yeah, so it's actually the first one. Um, script pub key it creates. Uh, so that first long line is the uh, the the group ID, and then there's the quantity of a thousand, which is what we minted. So it's all kind of there. Um, and here's how you do a limited supply. You just call single mint, and it gives you the group identifier in the transaction. Um, and then here's what the single mint vout looks like. Um, 
so you know this is uh, pretty well baked at this point. Um, oh, and people kind of ask about, um, um, you know, can I do this with op group? And one common thing is, can I have scheduled token releases? And the answer is yes. So you do a single mint, and then when you pay to you know certain um, outputs, you um, use uh, check lock time verify to say, okay, you know, this output can't be spent until after a certain time. Uh, so that's an easy solution. So are there any questions? Is there time for questions? Uh, you have time for, let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, Andrew. We have time for two really awesome probing questions. Yeah, one and then. Thanks. So, uh, hi Andrew. Um, on the op data sig verify, um, I see I'm I didn't look too much into it, and at the risk of backshedding, but you do the hashing after you covered the public key, and uh, wouldn't it be like better to basically just do the minimum thing and op data sig verify? Are you saying there's a bug in my code? <laughs> I said, are you, are you saying there was a bug in the code I put up there? Can you just go back to that code slide? Maybe we should debug this off offline. No, 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 it's, it's pretty quick. Get another no, question. No, 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 it's pretty quick. Just okay, go. okay, okay. Uh, so tell me when to stop. Uh, the, the, code pa the code page for data security. So next one, I think. Next one? Next one, next. Oh, the C++ code. Yes. So okay, right here. Yeah, mm -hmm. so at the bottom, you after you cover, recover the public key, you do the hash, the 160 hash. Um, can't you just not do that and do it in the script? So the script... Oh, you mean, uh, yeah, so call, uh, yeah, so call op hash 160 in the script? Yes. Yeah, I suppose you could, yeah. Great, now we figured that out. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we're out of time for our next presenter. I'm sorry, Andrew. That's okay. Okay. Great. All right, thank you. Give it one more time for Andrew Stone, please.